John Bonham, the heartbeat of Led Zeppelin. The hardest hitting, tightest, and potentially most versatile drummer was an absolute powerhouse. From fast drumming on songs like rock and roll to slow yet powerful blues drumming on songs like Since I've Been Loving You, Bonzo's drumming was the driving force behind Led Zeppelin's sound. When asked about his bandmate, Jimmy Page said, Some people will always wonder why Led Zeppelin didn't continue after Bonzo's death. And the reason will always be clear. No one could ever replace Bonham. He was Led Zeppelin, the heart, soul, and power of the band. And no other can fill that hole left by Bonzo. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps if not the greatest drummer of all time, John Bonham was a beast of a drummer, an absolute grizzly bear of a drummer, and no one could ever take a spot. In this video, we'll be honoring his legacy and memory as several fellow contemporaries and disciples of Bonham alike have come together to honor the immortal legacy of John Bonzo Bonham. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel for more great content as it really helps us out. Anyways, let's get right into it. Number 15, Tommy Lee. My, my, my guy, my go-to, um, you know, inspiration from the first time I heard, uh, physical graffiti was John Bonham, Zeppelin man. And there was just nobody else that sounded like him with that heavy ass foot and the late snare drum, that kind of stuff just like makes the track sit back and groove and like, and just fucking heavy, man. And he would only play cymbals in the right spot, not just constantly smashing cymbals, which is fucking noisy and, and, and annoying. He would wait just to that right spot and then boosh. And just, I don't know, man, that John Bonham, another one. Fuck. I wish I would have got to meet and see play live. I never got to see him play live. Um, you know, only ever seen, you know, a video or DVD of, of the guy play. Um, no, and have seen his, his son Jason play, who's fucking rad too. It's, it's a little little crazy when you close your eyes you're like whoa dude he plays a lot like his dad yeah. number 14 jim keltner I, I didn't know what led zeppelin was and we were kind of tripping backstage and, and i tapped on the bass drum bonham's bass drum and it just it just went boom like what like there was no like my bass drum was you know hollywood recording ready with the blanket in it and the front head off and his was just exactly the opposite. Both heads on, nothing inside. You could tell you just it just went boing. I said maybe it's kind of like a Salvation Army kind of thing, you know. Like I was thinking like maybe some big marching bass drum kind of sound. That night, to watch them was incredible. Number 13, Kevin Parker. Obviously no uh, discussion about drum sounds and drum playing would be complete without talking about John Bonham and the Led Zeppelin drum sound. Like the famous Led Zeppelin drum break is uh, Levy, when the Levy breaks. So I was gonna do when the Levy breaks, but I kind of just feel like everyone else, is, it, it's, it's been covered, you know. I feel like most people got the wrong idea. Like there's this idea that Led Zeppelin drums are like super, like powerful, solid, people say he like, hit like a bricklayer. But I don't think that's actually true. I think there's a lot more of a delicate way that he played, the way he sort of goes from smacking the drum and playing a teensy little ghost note. It's just a really quiet hit. And it's, it's usually a really quiet hit in between a normal hit. It's, it just adds dynamic to your playing. So I think the reason why people think that Bonham hit the drums so hard and why people, when they try to replicate Bonham, they just smack the drums is because the compression makes it sound louder than it is. You can hit a drum quite quietly and using compression you can make it sound a lot more energetic. But for me, like, emotion in rock drumming is, is just John Bonham. Yeah. Number 12, Chad Smith. He, to me, was the best rock, rock drummer. He, he did play with a ferocious energy, but he had the finesse as well. He wasn't just a pounder. He played, you know, very dynamically and played beautifully and musically for that music. But he was an innovator, How you know, from the very beginning, 
from note one of the first Led Zeppelin record, Good Times, Bad Times, he had his sound and he had his and he had the way he played and and he was doing this thing with his foot that no one would, had really done in rock and roll. For my money, it's it's jump on him. His swing, the swing that he, the way that he played made that music so uh you know, just danceable. He was incredible. Number 11, Mike Portnoy. John Bonham is one of my all-time biggest drum heroes. In fact, I have his uh, his symbol tattooed on my leg, and and uh, he's always always been one of my biggest drum heroes. And uh, not only me, I mean, he's influenced, I think, every drummer that's picked up a pair of sticks, you know, beyond the 70s. Uh, his style was just, was so universally... Um, uh, able to transcend genres. I think jazz drummers loved him, rock drummers loved him. He's one of those guys that, uh, you know, he played with such a heavy groove and he had these nuances in his playing that, that, that just made him one of a kind. And I've heard people say, you know, how, how did John Bonham get that drum sound? You know, was it the way that you mic'd the drums or the way you tuned the drums? The reason John Bonham sounded that way is because he was John Bonham. It wasn't the way that the drums were mic'd or the way the drums were tuned or the type of drums or the type of sticks. It was him that made those grooves sound the, sound the way they did. And he just played with weight and groove and, and feel and, and there's, I don't know if there's any, ever been a drummer that has really duplicated his feel exactly. A lot of times people think about Bonham and they talk about the kick drum. And uh, yes, I mean, he had this big 26 inch kick drum, the big boomy roomy sounding kick was, was definitely part of his signature. But I think people underestimate the sound of his snare and his hi-hats. I think his snare and hi-hats were very, very, very much a part of his signature sound as well. Number 10, Taylor Hawkins. Every drummer in America in 1975 wanted to sound like John Bonham because he was the best. He got the best drum sound. His drums were tuned the best. He was in the biggest band. He was the best. Number nine, Lars Aldrich. When the levee breaks, I mean, that's mm -hmm. classic Bonham. The drums are big, thunderous, ambient. He's a little bit behind on the snare. And it's got that groove, and he's in a pocket. But I'll have to go with John Bonham. Number eight, Ian Pace. John and I never actually got to be our close friends because we were always working all the time. So when we did meet up with each other, it was generally a very nice liquid night. <laughs> and uh, uh, we enjoyed each other's company quite a lot. Uh, and, yeah. I think the last time I saw John, we used to go to a club in London called the Speakeasy, which was a nice, a nice late night bar. And uh, I'd driven there in my car and I realised it was going to be a really good night. So I drove the car home again and got a taxi in. Just being Mr. Sensible. Very responsible, Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the bar shut at 3 o'clock in the morning and John was still. He's still in coma and he still wants to fight his war. So he said, come on, we're going to see some friends who are rehearsing in the country. So we're like, well, how are we going? Don't worry, man. We're going to go outside and it's uh, he has this lovely Aston Martin car. And he's very, very drunk at this stage. I said, don't worry, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. So he gets in the car. And coming out of London, there's a little bit of motorway, uh, autobahn, where the speed limit is 60 kilometers. We were doing 200. <laughs> well, the whole way. Uh, and like typical we got, we didn't see one police car, we had no problems. But the road, which was three lanes wide, was only just wide enough for John to drive this car. <laughs> and God bless him, that was the last time I saw him. But uh, when, he, when he said he lived his life to the full, he really meant it. But the most important thing about what John did was what we still listen to today. 
he had a, a way of simplifying everything that was needed in the piece of music he was playing to get the maximum effect, effect in the drums he was playing. Not only did he do that, he did it with an amazing sound. Nobody's drums sounded like John's drums, and nobody's drums sound like that today. <laughs> Number seven, Dave Grohl. It seemed like there was nothing that John Bonham couldn't do. He just could do everything. And in a way that was so powerful. Number six, Bill Collins. I saw John Bonham play at the Marquee Club with Tim Rose, who was uh, an American singer. And he, uh, he did this hit version of Morning Dew. And he was on tour. And he had uh, this guy, John Bonham, on drums. And I went to see Tim Rose. But when I saw Bonham, <laughs> I had never seen anything like it. But he had the best bass drum for, uh, of anybody I've ever seen. And he just, I became a con convert there and then, you know. And so I started to follow him where, wherever he was doing, rumored to be playing in a band. Next time I saw him was with, um, was uh, at the marquee with Led Zeppelin, which was, the, it was still called the New Yardbirds. My God, you went to one of those shows. Yeah. Crikey. And actually, I went. To the, I was big Yardbirds fan. I went to see the Yardbirds the, the afternoon Jeff Beck joined because Eric had left in the afternoon. I went to see them with Jimmy Page on bass, and that eventually became Led Zeppelin. You know, this the early Led Zeppelin is you know it was was something to behold because I mean nobody was doing that. Number five, Carmine and Pice. Uh, we were in Vanilla Fudge and we were doing great. We had uh, three three albums on the charts. I hit a single all on the, you know, everything in the top 20. And we took a new band on the, on tour with us. His name was Led Zeppelin. I met this new guy, this drummer, John Bonham. Nobody ever heard of him. You know, I heard of him because we had the album before anybody else. So we listened to it, you know, when in those days, if somebody wanted to tour with you, you got a hold of their album. If you liked it, you can... Let them do it. If you didn't like it, they wouldn't, you know, they can't do it. We loved their album. I love what he did. And when I met him, he was green. You know, nobody ever saw him, you know. He, John Bonham was, you know, totally unknown. And the album wasn't even out yet when we uh, met him, and they did the first gig with us. And I found out a couple of years ago that we actually paid half the, uh, the fee. Uh, they got $1,500 for the first gig they ever did in America, and we paid, Vanilla Fudge paid seven fifty of it. That's pretty funny, right? Uh, but uh, when I met John, he was uh, totally unknown, and he had told me that you know I was one of his influences, his idol influences, like you know, Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, me, and you know, a few other people, Bernard Purdy, and and that. And I said, oh, thank you, you know. And again, you got to understand, nobody ever heard of this guy, you know. And I told him I loved his bass drum. I loved the bass drum thing he did. And he told me that he got it for me, and I said, no, I don't do that. And he actually pointed out to me on a Vanilla Fudge album where I did do it once. You know, I did it like a dot, do da dot, do da dot, do da dot, you know, quarter notes on the snare and a triplet on the bass drum. And I just played it. I didn't even know what I was doing, probably. I went back and listened, and it was there. I said, wow. And I went back to him, I said, you're right, it was there. He goes, yeah, I took that, and I made it into my own thing. And I said, well, I love that thing. Then when he saw my big blonde maple drums, that was it. He flipped out. He said, can you think you can hook me up with Ludwig to get a kit like that? I said, well, I'll see what we can do. I remember calling Ludwig saying, this new guy, John Bonham, his group Led Zeppelin, I think they're going to be big. Understatement of four decades? Yes. Um, got John the same exact kit as mine. Uh, double bass drum, even. And he did play that double bass drum kit in 1969 when we toured together for the whole summer. And uh, after that, Robert and Jimmy told him it was too much and they got rid of the one bass drum. When they did that, that's what became the Led Zeppelin drum set, the big 26 bass drum, the big front tom, big toms in the side, the six and a half inch deep snare, and the gong. Yes, so I had the gong also. And uh, But he was a great guy and... Um, yeah, I loved him, and he uh, even came to one of my clinics one time uh, in New Jersey. I ran into a guy that 
ran the store as a Sam Ash store. He said he still had the beer bottle that John drank out of that night. So um, he was a great dude. Number four, Roger Taylor. And the best rock and roll drummer in the world, John Bonham, sadly lost in 1980. A ferocious power and attack of the combination enabled the band to turn from a juggernaut into a dragonfly in a moment. They took the US by storm, ruling the stadiums of America and remain the most popular act there to this day. All this, but still keeping out of the mainstream in the UK by refusing to release singles or appearing on top of the pops, which ironically used a bad cover version of A Whole Lot of Love for its theme tune. In short, they wrote the book and influenced thousands of bands to come. I know, because we nicked quite a bit from them. They don't make bands like this anymore. Britain should be proud of them, true legends. The magnificent Led Zeppelin. Number three, Ginger Baker. The general public are so fucking dumb that, you know, like, that anybody could think that Bonham was anywhere near a, this kind of drummer I am. But it's just extraordinary. Bonham had technique, but he couldn't swing a fucking sack of shit. Or Mooney, for that matter. I mean, if they were still alive today, ask them. <laughs> Number two, Stuart Copeland. Uh, I didn't. Well, he, his son Jason says we met, but I, how could I not remember meeting John mm -hmm. Bonham for Christ's sake? Um, uh, and uh, so I don't have a memory of meeting him, although I'm told that we did <laughs> meet. How you know? How's it possible? Um, because he was so, he was before me, therefore when we would have met, he would have been him, and I was just little old me yeah. at the time. Uh, and so it's hard to imagine. But yes, he, uh, he was not known to be a, a one, wonderful company. No. Uh, Trouble. A human being. But dang, drummers argue long into the night about how did he get that monstrous sound, the size of it. You know, not just what he plays, but how he plays it and how he gets... It's like he's he's playing on a mountain. He's got, yeah. you know, the earth shakes when he hits those tom-toms. How does he do that? We're all we're all scratching our heads about that. Number one, Bill Ward. I, uh, I, uh, want, I want to uh, uh, say a few words about John Bryan. Uh, but first of all, I want to thank these guys. I want to thank Brian. I want to thank Walter at the back of Carmine. Um, all the guys that are here who have given me this incredible award. And I love what you shared, Brian. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm really honoured that, that, that this is coming to pass for me. You know, um, I've been uh, playing drums since I was about five years old, and I'm 65 now, so. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I first, met, uh, I first met John Bonham when I was about 15 years old and um, there's some, there's some uh, little things that I wanted to share with you, especially if we have a room full of drummers and friends of drummers, and, you know, the percussion world lives on and the percussion world always must live on, you know. Um, uh, but the thing that I wanted to share about John Bonham was uh, uh, the first thing I noticed was um, was his feet, and, uh, <laughs> and he played funny drums. <laughs> he played a funny one, and I could never figure it out. I'm going, he's playing out of time. He's playing out of time, you know, and I just couldn't get it. I couldn't. I just couldn't find where that one was, you know. And uh, we, John's feet, you know, he, if you've ever seen a boxer. Uh, like he was light of foot, uh, and he was um, he's uh, very light on his on the on the foot plate, you know. And I noticed that was one of the first things I noticed. He was kind of kind of danced, danced like a boxer, you know. And um, and he's uh, and, he, and, he, and what he did with the bass drum was just so incredible. You know, I, I see John as the as the guy who brought all the swing out of the past and a lot of the things out of the past was one of the most well-known drummers of that era that really brought it into rock and roll as we know rock and roll today. You know, so a lot of, a lot of us old-timers, I know that we were influenced by 
you know, body or gene, gene Cooper in my particular case. But you know, it all came back to uh, it all came back to uh, to where it was at in the mid '60s, and uh, and uh, Bonham was uh, outstanding in the, a lot of that bass drum work. I'll tell you a little story about when we were about 16 years old, and John and I played in different bands, and uh, he used to test his bass drums, and I used to go up there with him. I'd go up to the club wherever we were going to play. And I'd have my bass drum, and he'd have his bass drum. And he'd say, now listen, <laughs> he said, just stand about 10 feet away from the bass drum. I want to I wanna know if it kicks you in the stomach. <laughs> and uh, so, I'm on the, so there's his bass drum right there, you know, and he's yelling at me and everything. In the way that he had about him. <laughs> and uh, so I'm standing there, about 10 feet away from the bass drum, and he kicked it. And I felt, I felt a, a, a punch in my gut, man, that I'll never forget. And that's what it was like standing in front of John Bonham's bass drum. When he kicked that thing, man. Yeah! That, that, that's when he was 16 years old. So a lot of stuff was going on before he came around and met up with Planty and Page and, uh, and uh, John Paul Jones, you know, but of course, Another, I, I, I had some time about three years ago uh, where I was able to be with Jimmy Page for about uh, about an hour, you know, and I've known Jimmy off and on over the years. And, um, and I said to Jimmy, there was one time when John had come to the studios and he was playing my double bass drum. And as Brian had said earlier, you know, I kind of went into a lot of drums and Bonham would always say, Why well, can't you need so many drums? You know, and I'd be like, well, I like I like to play a lot of drums if it's okay with you. You know, you don't mind. You know, fucking, you know, you play what you want to play, and I'll play what I want to play. But uh, so he get he gets he gets behind my double bass drum kit, and uh, it was scary. It was so scary. And when when I was in the car with Jimmy, I was saying that when when he was playing those bass drums like he did, and I you know I know a lot of the guys up here tonight. I mean, I, Gene Hagler man is just by my by my ace guys, you know. And, uh, uh, but you know the what I wanted to say was that he started to put it together. He put his traps in and just like and he started to groove and he started to put it together. See, putting it together. And I thought, oh my God, you know, and he, all these different notes that he was playing, independence. He was playing all kinds of stuff. And he was just absolutely incredible, and I thought, my God, I wonder what would happen if they let him go and had two bass drums. And I wonder, I wonder what that would be like, to, you know, playing with some of the guys that we have today, today's metal and thrash, and you know, and all the great stuff that we have today. Uh, so I just want to share a couple of things with you about the master. Uh, I think if anybody wants to learn drums, then I would recommend to them. Listen to John Bonham. Yeah! You know, listen to John Bonham. Listen to this guy as well, but listen to John Bonham because it's 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 where it, <laughs> it's 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 where it's at. You know, it's uh, but um, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody. It's just that you know he he, he kind of uh, led led the way a little bit with some of those uh, some of those things. A classic blues player. He was a classic blues player, guys. And uh, so, anyway, I'm, I'm just proud and very, very grateful to be up here tonight to be able to say a few words about the man. And for watching this far, we actually have a very special interview. Ladies and gentlemen, the late, great John Bonham's son, the amazing Jason Bonham. There's quite a lot that, about my father that got kind of he was the heavy hitter. He was this. If you watch the 69, um, uh, the Albert Hall, he holds the stick really far in his hand. So it's he's not getting a big, a lot of throw. It's just the technique of where he hit the drum and how he tuned the drums. But my dad, he could play his kit, and it sounded like his kit. Then he would play my toy kit at home, and it still sounded like him. He said uh, at the time, it was literally a few months after, and, you know, you, you, in my mind, people were going, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So I was like, um, can I just get this out of the way? And I said, uh, uh, is it going to happen? He went, 
well, listen, no, no disrespect to you. He goes, what you know of your father is amazing. Um, he goes, but what we said all those years ago, we would be idiotic to continue on and not stand with what we said. We've done this. We did the show. We don't have to do it again. Uh, let's just leave it at that. You know, your father was such a huge part of wow. the band, you know. Anyways, what did you guys think of the video? What's your favorite Bonzo moment? Any favorite drum parts or drum beats you guys enjoy that Bonham simply developed and created all on his own? I mean, the man was simply undeniably perhaps the greatest of all time. I mean, he's just as synonymous with drumming as Jimi Hendrix is with the guitar. There's no other way to put it. Anyways, what's your favorite Bonzo moment and what's your favorite Led Zeppelin song. Let us know in the comments down below. What do you think of the video? Please leave a like, share, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And thank you so much for watching. Anyways, until the next video, I'll see you guys later. Thanks.